Hello and welcome to MBS Show Reviews. I am your host, Thomas Anzo. Joining me today is Silverquill. We will all be talking about the comic. Join us. Join, Join us. us. It will be a fun comic. Yes, it will. I'm smiling at the microphone right now. My cheeks hurt like nobody's business. But you're smiling. Smiling. Oh, uh, well, um, if you haven't, well, figured it out, um, this week we're going to review the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic comic, issue 48 to 50, the Chaos Theory or the Accord arc in the comics. Yeah. So, uh, a short synopsis is an astronomical event caused Discord to transform from a creature of chaos into a being of pure order. So, yeah, they did the 180 on Discord's character. So that's going to be interesting. Yes, after all that time inverting the other characters' personalities, he does it to himself. Which is really interesting. I do like this kind of storytelling. But before we dive deep into the stories, Silver, what was your first impression about this book? Oh, it was a, a tragic tale. My reaction, that is. At first, I was really getting into it. I enjoyed the threat. I enjoyed the character of Accord and how he was so different from Discord. Some of the similarities that they exhibited. Uh, definitely, the artwork was a mixture of humor and terror. As uh, Andy Price rendered this in some truly gruesome images. I mean, all these plastered smiles and uh, other other sights. But then at the very last issue, I feel that it lost balance. And in a weird way, it did so by losing respect for the group to glorify an individual. And that put kind of a sour end on the whole shebang. Hmm, all right, all right. Anything else to add to that? Well, n- nothing that we can't talk about without getting into spoilers. But for a comic that ends with a celebration of 50 issues, a true milestone for any comic line, It was kind of surprising, again, that the group got taken away so one character could shine when the whole topic of friendship is magic, is that it's multiple individuals coming together to make a better group. Hmm, I see your point now, yeah. With that explanation there, it does make sense why people didn't like the comic issue. That particular one. We'll see overall. Mm -hmm. And as for me, I... I'm okay with this story. Um, the comic here done by Andy Price and written by Ted Anderson was not bad. Um, I'm usually with the Katie Cook Andy Price combo, but since Katie Cook decided to went her own way, um, we were given, well, Anderson. Anderson's not bad, but it's just, I do believe that Price works well with Cook. But that's just my opinion. But, Overall, the comic here is one of those situations where you subvert your expectation for a character and twist it. It's a trope of D&D where what is the bad guy and what's the good guy? Like, you have your paladin, which is the embodiment of all good. But what happens if you push it to the limit? If you remember that one Batman episode or that one Justice League episode where... Um, Jaywalking is considered uh, of a criminal offense punishable by jail time. Oh, the Justice Lords. Yeah, that one. Yeah, they basically they wanted to make the world a safer place, so they got more violent. Mm-hmm. And to me, it seems that way because you have Discord here, who's really chaotic, who's really um, off the walls, really out of order. Suddenly you change him into a being of pure order and at first things seem okay, but what happens if you push it to the limit? And this is the comic for itself. And we do get a few scenes where um, Starlight's kind of worried about the whole court thing, blah, blah, blah. And near the end of the issue, we get to see the shift where, oh, why is Starlight getting more screen time? Why is this, oh no, this is, oh... It's this kind of comic, is it? Oh no. But I think we should save our final thoughts near the end. But still, um, I did enjoy this comic when I read it. But before we head into the comics, we have to give you a fair warning. We are going to spoil this comic. So if you have not read it, we suggest that you do. And welcome back. 
So we're going to take this a bit different because the comic itself is run number by numbers. And we're really interested in talking about the themes like Discord's transformation, uh, Celestia's dilemma, and also Starlight's rise. Huh? So we're going to focus on themes for this one. And what better way to start off with Discord? And Silver, why don't you start? Well, Discord himself, it's kind of funny that he only, he jokes, he's barely in this comic arc. I mean, he's Discord for a brief bit, but Awkward for 90% of it. Uh, and so he says, I need to get an editor. <laughs> or an agent. Uh, Discord in this one is, he's a grandstander, he wants all eyes on him. Basically, uh, he wants, he's trying very hard to socialize and be the life of the party, not realizing that he undermines the party. And it's kind of funny that this comic capitalizes on ideas put forth in the Friends Forever line. You had him trying to be nice to Fluttershy in Friends Forever number, uh, six, I believe, where he got every animal to talk normal. Oh yeah, that one, yeah. So he was trying to give Fluttershy a gift, but because he was a little awkward about it, she ended up freaking out. Which, <laughs> Fluttershy freaking out is like saying people breathing. <laughs> yeah, but this is a bit extreme, if I remember right. A bit extreme. And then later on in the Luna and Discord crossover, uh, Friends Forever, he re- admits that because he's grown to care so much about them and what they think of him, he's just very unsure of himself. He's not, he's not the same... Mm, in your face, I don't care what ifs mm-hmm, kind of draconicus yeah. he used to be. And so here, Discord, once he's offended everybody, we actually see him being very vulnerable. He's actually willing to give up who he is and suffer a death of the self just to see if he can fit in better. And that's pretty sad, really, because Discord here, he's, well, let's just say he's chaotic. He's very... How do I put this? He's one of your friends that's really loud and wants the attention, but he means well. He doesn't do this just to be malicious, but he's just there to, you know, be the life of the party. The pinky pie, as they say, without the filter. And that's Discord, to a T. Although we also had pinky pie without a filter, it was Joker pinky. Joker pie. Yeah, and they referenced that in here too, which I do like the callback. But Discord is not in this very much, though... I did love in the final issue where he holds up a sign saying, Applejack says she loves me. My life is now complete. Ah, yes. <laughs> what does that mean, fans? But did you notice how Fluttershy, like, when Discord turned to a court, Fluttershy is really distant. Like, she misses Discord. Like, there's some kind of OTP shipping that's been in the background or that's been there but never stated. You know what I mean? Well, she she is his biggest advocate. At points, especially in the first issue, she's making apologies for him, which almost makes it sound like an abused spouse. <laughs> I mean, he's really not that bad. I mean, if you get to know him, it's just like, no, no, don't, don't don't apologize for him. But I was disappointed that Fluttershy was not more vocal in trying to get Discord back. Because the biggest thing that bothered me about the early issues... The ponies are always going on about how mind control is wrong or how how Accord's actions are not justifiable. But he never threw back in their faces that they they were all for it when it benefited them. They were all for it when they thought that that the celestial alignment itself had forced Discord to change. They were all saying, Oh, he's much more likable, he's not so annoying. Not one of them said he's been changed by a force against his will. We have to help him. True, but at the same time, too, they didn't really understand what happened. The way Discord explains things is like me plus magic plus the alignment of the stars uh, equals to being a chord. So, yeah, that makes sense. And knowing uh, wibbly-wobbly magic stuff, they considered this to be normal. Wibbly-wobbly timey-wimey? Yes, hocus pocus stuff too. But at the same time, I, I, I really wish that Accord called them out on this because they, it's a good challenge to the reader. You know, how we, we talk about these high ideals, but 
how tempted are we to compromise them for convenience? Oh, true that, true that. And a court here, we're not saying that he's the end or be all uh, in terms of in your face kind of characters. Like, take that ponies, this is what you get for being high and mighty. No, no, no. We're, we're just saying that a court here is too good to be true. Starlight here even mentioned that what a court is doing here is similar to what I've been doing to my little town. And that's not right. In fact, for a good while, that is Starlight's main line of thought. I was evil. Now I'm good, so I know what's what. Yeah, and I think that's the problem there, too. We'll get into Starlight's role in good order. Ooh, order. Ah, yeah. Ah, ah. Oh, you. <clears throat> but still, uh, let's focus on um, Discord and Accord for a bit, because I think we've been all over the place in terms of what we've been talking, which is warranted, because each aspect of certain characters do mix well. So a court here, um, sorry, um, this court here, after feeling blue, decided to kind of change himself into a court. And we don't get to see much of this court. That, that's the sad part here. Like, even this court complain. And, uh, so this court's annoying, true, then changed into a court. So what do you think of a court when he first appeared? Well, one, he's in a suit with a monocle. How can you not love someone with a monocle? And a walking stick. Aha. Uh-huh. Yes, very sophisticated character. Aha. Uh-huh. Quiet. I'm trying to imagine if John Delancey could pull off a, a fine and dignic cue with a uh, very little, with a uh, very prim and proper attitude and rolling of the R's. It's John. I'm sure he can do it. <laughs> but Accord is, is fascinating. Right away, it seems like everything he's doing is more to the benefit of the uh, ponies around him than a detriment. It's only when he starts going a little bit too far, especially by uh, when he's brainwashing two architects to, to who disagree about the building of a hotel. True that. When we first get to see a court, the ponies are kind of on edge. Like, they don't really believe him. Like... You, you're, pro, you're, you're tricking us. That's not right. Like, you gotta be putting on some kind of game. And he explains, no, I'm Discord transform into order. I'm not even sure what I am anymore. Uh, it takes Twilight to look into a dictionary to see the opposite of chaos, which is accord. And Fluttershy here, I, like you mentioned before, I wish that Fluttershy here has more voice in the matter because she seems to be really worried and heartbroken by this. Well, she, in essence, lost a friend. True, true. And you can't treat Accord as the same guy because he's making a very big point to say he's very different from Discord. The different thing is um, when they walk to Town Hall and him demonstrating his orderly power from a kid's ice cream cone to a produce wagon and the cherry on the cake is the hotel. And the hotel here, like the two ponies in charge, like you mentioned before, they're not seeing eye to eye on the matter. They have two ideas on how to make the hotel. And the hotel itself shows that one has a light brown, one has a darker brown. And the whole aesthetics of the place is different. And I'm guessing if Two-Face were real, he'll enjoy the hotel for some reason. Oh, I'm sure he'd be split over it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it's a coin, coin flip for him. Probably. But still, like you mentioned before earlier, a court does his mind zappy thing to make the ponies in agreement. And he's the one that completed the hotel with his orderly magic. The hotel's done, by the way. So that's a plus, right? <laughs> it's the one good thing to come out of this uh, kerfuffle. Yeah, true, true. Because... Because afterwards, when he meets the princesses and his true motives come through, this is a little bit where he starts to become a one-note character. I mean, mm. Celestia is a little wary of him as he talks about his goal of unifying everyone. And then we get some of the best terrifying art that Andy Price has made. It hasn't been this good and creepy since Queen Chrysalis. Oh, which one? Like, is this the part where he? we have a close-up of Discord and his... Uh, and jaw and paw and claws, or 
the one with the fire, the one with smoke. Like, there's so many good scenes here. Like, just pick one. <laughs> I'm talking about the scene where the magic is coming out of his eyes, floating up into the air in a cloud, and infecting the eyes of uh, the support staff, including Kibitz. Yeah, that one, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, That's man. Pro- properly creepy. Followed closely by the next issue where... Uh, it's a red background and all the ponies are black silhouettes with creepy white smiles. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And eyes in the dark. It's quite terrifying, but it, here's the thing. Discord has al- was always able to, uh, impose his will as he did with Fluttershy. Just touch, zap, your, your, your opposite now. And one wonders why he didn't just do that to everyone. Well, the answer is it wouldn't have been fun. I think Discord never went Awkward's direction. Because he realized that making everyone like him would not, would not be fun. True, and the point of the sorry, and the way that he, I think he goes about having fun with Discord is, you know what? I want to see what happens if I pull the fire alarm. <laughs> like it's going to be fun for me just looking at people running around in a panic. But a court's way of doing things is. Okay, when I pull the fire alarm, I want to see everyone exit in a calm and orderly manner. So you get to see the big difference here, right? Two of the same madness, but different kind of outcome. Different outcome. and But after Accord has made his intentions known, for a while he is just, oh, I will bring order to everything. Order will be great. Mm-hmm. And that's him for most of issue two and a majority of issue three, or the 50th issue. And I think we'll save... The talk about Accord and Starlight for when we talk about Starlight herself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I was disappointed that having steamrolled, ignored, or out-argued every member of the cast, Accord would suddenly stop and let Starlight uh, dictate terms. Well, that is really unusual. But when it comes to a being of order, like Accord, I think he sees reason in listening to... Starlight, because I see where you're coming from. Let me hear your story, and I'll judge it for myself. But you're not going to win, by the way, because I'm just giving you a fair chance, because that's very orderly. That's what I'm thinking a court is thinking. Or he's just arrogant. He assumes he can win no matter what, and he can't imagine Starlight out out arguing him. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, too. And... Let's head on to the others, the main six plus two princesses and Spike. After the first issue, I don't think you really need to talk about the main six much. Mm-hmm. Well, at least we'll just point them out for a bit before we head on to the other two or three characters or four characters that matter. So the rest of the main six, um, let's just put, let's just put it like this. Fluttershy, Rainbow Dash, Pinkie Pie, Applejack, and Rarity, they don't seem to really matter. And like you mentioned before, Fluttershy is one of those characters where she has a close relationship with Discord. I would like to see her having more conflict other than what we've got in this comic, which is not much. Or trying to mend Discord's ways or uh, get him to behave a little bit better in public? Not even that. Like, talk to a court, like, get to know him and have a reaction of, you're not the same pony that, or you're not the same Draconicus that I knew. You're, you're totally different. Like, just have a heart to heart talk. And I would like to see where a situation where a court is debating or battling with himself in controlling Fluttershy. And we can have that whole scene where we get in, um, Return of Harmony Part 1. Uh, I, I don't know. Oh, I'd actually I'd like to see that. Oh, we must brainwash us the Fluttershies. No, so cute, sis. <laughs> oh, but we must this, this precious. Oh, but, but then we can't get to the hugs that we like so much. <laughs> oh, no. Not the hugs us. Oh. I'd, hear, I'd want to hear John Delancey do that, too. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the rest fives are... Kind of pointless. So, what about Celestia and Luna? The princesses. Well, let's just put the three princesses um, and Twilight. Oh, Twilight. Well, poor Luna and Twilight. They go on a journey through 
Accord's mind to try and get Discord back. And it is a fun callback to when, uh, when Luna entered Discord's mind and instead of a chaotic mess of jumbled hallways and weird talking creatures, it's Cubicleville. <laughs> which, there we are, Daddy. Well, in modern times, the Cubicleville is, I think has become, has been viewed as the death of the individual. You've been <laughs> absorbed into the corporate structure and now you live your life in a tiny box. Oh, yeah, yeah. But you have individuality in those boxes. You can put your Funko minifigures, you can put posters, but only if it's okay with HR. Uh, <laughs> sigh. <laughs> oh, no, that, that Dilbert poster there? Take it out, take it out. It's not, it's not, uh, friendly. It's not, it's not company friendly. Unfortunately, Twilight and Luna's role is basically just to get captured and brainwashed. They yeah. reveal to the audience what happened and how the main six's frustrations with Discord hurt him. It was a touching scene when Twilight hugged the remnant of Discord and apologized so profusely. I kind of wish Applejack had a moment like that. But in terms of the story, they never are able to convey what needs to happen to the outside world. And as a result, they never really contribute towards the solution. And so they're rendered pretty ineffective, which is a frustrating event. Yeah, that's the thing when I read through this, I'm just wondering, like, what's the point of them going into a court's mind? Like, what did that even accomplish? Well, like I say, for the reader, we learned why Discord changed, but ultimately it didn't accomplish anything to move the story forward except taking Twilight and Luna out of the equation. I don't mind them being brainwashed like that, but you gotta put some kind of setup. Have them be in the mind, but have some kind of contingency plan, or have some kind of way to communicate to the group that, hey, uh, this is going on, and I have to give out a signal that, okay, this is how you solve the problem. Yeah, just something to participate and say that we're, we're down but not out. Yeah, it's like blinking the eyes as Morse codes. Actually, given that Twilight can project herself into inanimate objects now, thanks to Royal Problem, mm-hmm. uh, obviously they wouldn't have known this at the time of the comic, but it's kind of funny to see what Twilight could do to work from under Accord's control. Mm, yeah, but we still don't really understand, or we don't really fully understand what's going through the mind of the ponies that are being controlled. All we know that each pony being controlled is part of a cord. And one of the scariest images is him projecting his face onto various ponies, including Vinyl Scratch. And, okay, Vinyl Scratch, yes, but uh, have you seen Wildfire? <laughs> Wildfire. Uh, that's Sibzi's character. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I remember that. Oh, quite quite or, terrifying. Or Andy Price. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy does weird things to his OC. Yeah, I know. It's like, mm, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's not creepy at all. No, no, not creepy at all. <laughs> ah, but still. <clears throat> uh, what about Celestia? What do you think of her? Oh, the injustice done to Celestia. Of all the characters, I empathize the most with her because we see her subjects, her family, her her beloved student. All of it is getting stripped away in front of her. And she, there's this feeling of frustration as this is just a force that she can't stop. And then Accord, one of the funniest images is when Accord says, oh, I'm just like you, Celestia. And she gives this, what? <laughs> That's just a priceless, oh, priceless artwork. Uh, 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 oh, you. But then she hits this low point on the train where she's like, well, Accord's winning, so maybe uh he's right. And I was like, no, this is something I cannot see Princess Celestia in the show doing. In fact, first off, it's it's following the idea that whoever wins is morally right. That's simply not true. And people have asked, well, what about with the main six and their victories? Does that make them automatically right? It's like, no, it doesn't. It's what they do afterwards. It's the opportunities they create as a result of that victory that shows that there, there might be more to their perspective, that they are more justified because their attitude creates opportunities. If the villain wins, it shuts down 
uh, chances for growth or creativity. So to have Celestia saying, oh, well, maybe he's right. I was like, no, Celestia has been in this fight longer than anyone. She's had to deal with things more than anyone. If anyone is going to stand firm and reassure the others that, yes, we are facing a dark period, but we have to keep going because this is the right thing to do, it should be Celestia. And I feel the comic did her a great disservice uh, with that moment of doubt, followed by having her get the chance to control the element of magic once again, to take a stand and fight alongside the main six, and lose. Ha <laughs> uh, ha! Well, it's Celestia fighting, so she will lose. But isn't that sad in and of itself, that we've come to just expect that as the default? <laughs> yep. Yep. Yep, it is. <laughs> So we need the Celestia win out here, peeps. Indeed, that, that is true. But back to what you mentioned about might makes right. That philosophy is not right. True that if you're stronger than your opponent and you win, that means you're right somehow. But in this scenario here, I can understand why Celestia is giving up because a court's doing something which she has been doing for a long time which is taking the easy way out and pushing harmony in your face. Well, you're saying that Celestia's been doing that all this time, taking the easy way out? No. Um, did I phrase it that way? I'm, I'm afraid it came across that way. Oh, okay. So what I meant was uh, she's been doing the whole thing of trying to unify Equestria in, well, under one flag of harmony, but she's doing it the hard way, which is hard work, diplomacy, and trust. A court here is just, hey, you know what? You, me, friends, done. Oh, instantly. Yes. No hassle. Don't you agree? Well, Starlet does make a good argument for why that's not real harmony. Yeah, true. I, I like to go with us. We banter a lot. We kind of agree and disagree on certain things. But, hey, that's balance. You need balance in almost everything. If you have too much of one thing, that's not good. So, but... Even then, she, ah, Celestia just doesn't get a lot of respect, which is why it's funny in issue 50 that there's a sub story where, where Discord changes her into a Pegasus to enjoy a, a day just being herself. Somehow that's a more positive display of Celestia than, uh, what is it? Three issues. <laughs> uh, yep. How, how about almost the whole entire line of the MLP comics, except for, well, uh, Friends Forever or Micro Series 6, or is it 12? I forgot. Is it 12, was it? Where Luna and Celestia, you know, that issue there, or the one with Spike or so on. Like, we have only a few good Celestia comics. Yep, she is a tough cookie to write for because she doesn't get a lot of uh, characterization or screen time, and if she does, she's usually losing. Mm -hmm. That's frustrating. Uh, uh, but I gotta say, Celestia losing is getting, it's lost its effectiveness. Mm -hmm. If anything, I'd love to see an issue where the ponies are having some trouble and Celestia realizes, okay, this is, this is a time where I have to step in and help them end the problem. It's something they can't accomplish on their own, but with my help, they can. Boom. There you go. Celestia gets more positive showing and we remember why she's the, Basically, the queen of this land. Princess. <laughs> but still, I don't get what you mean. Celestia needs that positive reassurance because um, I, I think that Season 7 did a good thing with um, Royal Problems. Uh, well, we get a lot of development for their characters. With this comic here, yeah, Celestia is not being shown in a really good light. She doubts herself... And it takes Starlight of all ponies to step her out of this. And they did a few good callbacks to previous comics, like the one from the Mirror arc and the uh, Dark Waters arc, even one of the pony episodes where nobody really remembers. Remember that episode where Rarity turned evil? Oh, Inspiration Manifestation, yeah. Yeah, nobody really remembers that one. Oh, I remember it. I almost forgot. But all in all, um, it's a good callback for everything that's been done in the past, like um, comics and episodes. And over here, we also get to see 
a, a really nice and cool moment where Celestia dons the element of magic again. And I have to bring something up. What? How are the elements still there? Well, she makes a mention that she's going to teleport to the Tree of Harmony and retrieve the elements. And put them in the jewelry? I thought they were stuck on the trees. Like, eh. Well, I guess, I'm, I'm guessing you can, one can whip up necklaces pretty easy. Too sweet, even. Okay, I mean, still. Uh, I, I thought the transformation for the ponies now is rainbow power, like how Dragon Ball is now with Super Saiyan Blue. Well, Dragon Dragon Ball has a new shade of Saiyan for every occasion. <laughs> True that. But it's why it's so frustrating to see Celestia resume her link to the element of magic. And even though she has the disclaimer, I'm not sure I can use it to its full power, the fact that they use this great strength and lose <laughs> is just a slap in the face. Yep. Well, it's Celestia using it, so the chances of losing is high. <laughs> Well, see, see, this is the, this is it. This is the humor. Everyone's it's become a joke. Celestia's become a joke as a defender, <laughs> uh, and that's actually yeah. disappointing. Oh yeah, I, I I I totally agree with that statement. There, in all honesty, as a fan of the show, I want to see an episode where this is Princess Celestia, and this is why she's in charge. At least I want to have a good reason of. Why is she in charge, not Luna? I mean, we got that in Royal Problems and whatnot, but not to the fullest extent of showing or demonstrating her full abilities. But still, uh, we've mentioned the three princesses already. And, well, we're kind of skirting around the issue. And let's talk about Starlight Glimmer. Ah, uh, the Glimmy Glam, who... This comic did not do much to stem the people who are more set against her. Ah, uh, yes. And if I'm not mistaken, this is after the season six ender, right? Uh, this comic came out very close to the end of season six. And so everyone was still like, oh, Starlight is so OP. She's just a Mary Sue self-insert. Mm, yeah. Bah. If I'm not... And if I'm not mistaken, um, the season ender was leaked before the American release, so uh, wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff and timing. So people were really, really um, salty with the ending for this one. Very much so. And if I'm not mistaken, you're salty too, right? Well, I don't know if I'm going to say salty because I don't resent Starlight. I actually like her character more than when she first signed on. But. There's a balancing act to making a character look good. And here's the thing. Starlight doesn't learn anything from her fellow ponies. She's the one who spots the flaw in Accord right away. She's the one who lectures Celestia about Harmony. And she's the one who can, one, throw up a shield in time to block the elements of Harmony. Which, think about that for a minute. The most powerful magical items in the land and Starlight can block their energy. But then, uh, her character shields are on full as Akkor decides, no, I won't brainwash you. I will accept your challenge, uh, and make you want to, uh, to accept my way of things. Oh, you've convinced me. I will basically kill myself. <laughs> the only way to win is not to play. So here's the thing. Starlight is never truly vulnerable in this, in this series. She runs from danger, same as anyone, but she's never in danger of being caught. She's never doubts their own uh, abilities or their own efforts. And she has the answer for everything, even without any feedback from, say, uh, the brainwash Twilight. And because of this, you start to say, well, why is everyone else here? If Starlight has this covered, what's the point in every other character in this show? That's a big difference from To Wear and Back Again, where Starlight was filled with self-doubt, uh, very anxious, couldn't have made it without other, without the aid of her unlikely companions, either taking the bullet for the team or giving her encouragement. There's a huge difference there. I'm all for To Wear and Back Again, not so much the end of this uh, Chaos Theory arc, because it's trying so hard to boost Starlight by making everyone else irrelevant. And that is what causes resentment rather than admiration. 
I'm playing devil's advocate here and the thing is with this comic, it's not that it's not being set up. It's being set up since the train ride or since the part where Starlight mentioned to Twilight that, hey, um, I think what a course doing is not cool. But that's not enough. Like, you have to gradually build that sense of, hey, I think Starlight here is an awesome character. But we didn't get any of that. What we got is Starlight here being the quote-unquote Mary Sue or this ex machina for problem solving. Because if you really think about it, if she's not in this scene, who else would be in her place? And I have an answer for that. Fluttershy. Let's just say Starlight is not in this scene at all. Let's just say she's in the Crystal Empire hanging out with Sunburst. Fluttershy would be a good candidate to turn a court back to Discord. Or have Applejack address him and he has to confront the logical loop. She's the, she is the most honest of ponies, but she's telling me my way is wrong. So she must be lying, but she can't be lying because she's the most honest of ponies. Mm-hmm. And that could have worked better, but eh, what's done is done. And this is the result of what we got. Well, but here's the thing. Sometimes the whole point of looking at what didn't work is not to wag our fingers at the authors or or say, oh, the comics just don't care anymore. I, I find those comments tiresome. It's for young writers listening out there, uh, getting feedback, learning from what other people tried and maybe didn't work out can help down the road with your own creative work. Mm -hmm. True that, true that. And in this case, it's boosting one character by making everyone else less confident never really empowers them. Having an established character with some kind of existing relation with another, like what I mentioned before, if you guys have Fluttershy being the one to change the tide here, it will make a lot of sense. But still, uh, if any writer from the sh comics are listening to us talking or banter about this, take the idea. It's free. I don't want any credit. All I want is a good story. Go, take. I will say, thinking back on it, there are little tweaks I think could help ease it. I'm not trying to say Starlight can't defeat or out outclass uh, Awkward. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it needs to feel more of a group effort. So, number one, rather than Applejack uh, being the one complaining about Discord's behavior, let it be Starlight, who's really wanted to just to socialize with everyone, you know, create some positive memories as a group. And here's Discord getting in the way. So right off the bat, there's a, there's a tension between them. Then, when they're on the train ride, let Starlight be the one to express doubt about what's going to happen next. And then Celestia can give her the motivational talk, saying, no, we, we, we must resist. This is why. Mm -hmm. That way, when Starlight, it's Starlight versus Accord, she's drawing on the input of others, on lessons she's learned from her friends, and becoming the champion of true harmony. Then it feels like she's been enriched by her relationships, rather than this, oh, I was evil before, so that's my sole motivation and mm -hmm. my, the sole reason for all my insight. It's like, ah, come on. And also I have to point out to people at home who are wondering, hey, is it Starlight and Discord kind of friends? Why are they not friends in this one? Because what I mentioned before could apply to Starlight here with how um, my wish that Fluttershy was the one to kind of talk a court down. If you think about it in the sense of Starlight, it can work because they're best friends. They've been through high waters together. They've been through a lot to solve the whole chrysalis thing problem. From what I can tell here, this is before that. It certainly gives that impression, but then, well, sometimes it's, just, it's hard to tie in the continuity. Starlight didn't seem to recognize Discord in uh, Into Air and Back Again as if that was their first meeting. True. But now, who knows? Who knows? Like the writers for the show say, a comic canon and TV canon are not the same. So, take that with a pinch of salt. I think we're not done, right? There's more to mention about Starlight. And I think you have a few plans. Like, you mentioned only plan A. No, I can't say I had a plan B. I mean, you, you use the elements, you're kind of up a creek if that plan A doesn't work. Ah, uh, true that. 
But it would have been nice if perhaps Starlight received a message from Twilight saying, this is what you need to do, or this is what has to happen to get Akkor to stop. Give her just a little bit of some, a nugget of info on which Starlight can capitalize. But as yeah. it is, it's sort of funny. Here's Starlight championing the individual against the group think, basically. <laughs> and what a turn that is. But, oh, you know, there is a fun, there's a fun juxtaposition that <laughs> she tried to make everyone the same and equal. Now here's Akkor doing that even more effectively. If anything, if she's to champion the need for diversity, she should receive information from diverse sources. And like I say, she never really takes anything from the other say to heart. It's just her own experience. And I'm like, you're, you're undo- undermining her own message. Getting feedback from others would greatly help Starlight here, just for the fact of she getting input from individualities or individuals and stating that there's more to gain in being different rather than being the same. Yeah, and to be honest, I, I don't know if there's anything more to be said about uh Starlight. It's kind of funny that having saved the day and been the grand champion, the final page where they're celebrating friendship is magic. It's all the characters who were defeated and served very little purpose in the story, and she's in the background saying hi to Caden Shining Armor in the first appearance of Flurry Heart. Hey. Uh, boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, um, one thing I need to mention, Discord ships Luna and Twilight. It's an OTP that he agrees to. Where did he say that? Look at the box. Oh, yes, the shipping. <laughs> Special delivery. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, but jokes aside, in the end, the day is saved once again by Starlight Glimmer talking a court down and Discord returning back to the front where he is the master of chaos and complains that he's not in this comic a lot. Mm. And that is a valid point on his end. Mm-hmm, true that. And we end on Friendship is Magic. <laughs> And I say that's a good end. Well, I say it's an end. Yep. It's an ending. And we get all of these characters from the background. There's a changeling up in the corner, the buffalo mm-hmm. and the deer way back. Yeah. Tiberius is giving Philomena what for, which, given that she's kind of a psychotic little uh, phoenix, I can't help but feel it's deserved. Yep. And also we get some of these show people in, like Heather Breckel, uh, Kitty Cook, Andy Price, Alice Price, and the Watcher, or the Observer. Is that what you call them? Observer? Uh, I think, I think he's called the Watcher Pony. Yeah, the Watcher Pony, yeah, you got them. And, you know, it's, it's fun. It's, it's a, it's a nice, cute way to end the 50th issue. But in all honesty, well, I, I think we should go to our final thoughts, unless you need to add anything more. Where is Owlicious in this in this grand uh, final page? On top of Spike. Oh, there. Okay, yes. Hiding right in front of my eyes. <laughs> so, um, let's go to final thoughts. All right. Well, my final thought is that Accord is a very intimidating and powerful enemy, which made him fascinating. This story does a lot to show the dangers of extremes, how tempting it is to embrace one extreme only to re- have it blow up in your face. That's very believable. It's really only the final part where I feel that it loses its cohesion because it gives all the power and all the all the authority to one character. In a weird way, it's, it's granting Starlight the very power that Awkward seeks, and I think that undermines the whole thing. If one character is meant to strike the final blow, I'm all for that, as long as they've learned something from their peers that gives them the ability to strike this final blow. I mean, Twilight learned everything about friendship so she could get the element of magic in the very first uh, two-parter. She didn't just know what to do on her own, and the others were tag-along body shields. (laughs) Cannon forders. Yeah, so it's amazing how one ending can really wound a story. But it's not the worst thing. I think there's still a lot of fun things to take away, like Andy Price's artwork, some visual styles, Celestia going, what? (laughs) But it's just that ending that I can't put this at the top of my list. Yeah, I I can understand that. 
And as for me, I am okay with this comic. It's 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 a rocky comic. It it started out good, but by the time when it reached the middle, I already knew that oh, this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a huge problem. And when we reached the end, my doubts and worries were true. And you know what? Andy Price's art here is good. And the writing by Ted Anderson is not bad. And overall, it was really entertaining. I like the idea, but the execution of it was, well, lacking, for a better word. So, would I recommend reading this? Yeah, I totally do. Just for the fact that you get to know some of the characters a bit more. Not fully, because this is the comic, but fanfic writers, this is some of your material here. Like I mentioned before, Fluttershy's interaction with Discord here is priceless. Where there is. And Silva, I think we're neglecting one thing. And I think we should do a bonus review. And that is for the pony who has everything uh, mini story here. Oh yes, uh, Celestia gets to be a pegasi for a day. Yep, and the art is done by Jay Foskett. Foskett. In stereo. Yay. So, Silver, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, l- let's try to be quick with this one. Oh, this is just a fun romp where we get to see we get to see Celestia enjoying life without the royal title setting expectations. The whole time where she's hosting her own birthday party, she's physically exhausted, didn't even get to enjoy her own cake, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of funny. I, as, as we're doing this show, the last night I helped celebrate my father's 70th birthday, and I know how exhausting that can be when you're setting up and playing the host. <laughs> so right off the bat, I'm, I'm enchanted with her more and more. <laughs> But then Accord, uh, Discord gasses her. That's a little creepy. And he turns her into a Pegasus. But we can see here just cut loose and enjoy being silly, being uh, interacting with ponies, not having any sort of expectations. And the funniest part is where she wants something scandalous. She wants Rarity to make her a black dress. Ooh. Do you know the black dress has history with animated characters? No, I don't. Black, what black dress would that be? Well, in Kim Possible, she had the black dress. Um, the LBD, if I remember right, little black dress. Oh, well, uh, I confess I have not really watched a lot of Kim Possible. Well, I think the trope is around. If I were to Google it, I wonder if I can find anything. Let me see. And continue on with your thoughts, Silver. I'll try and Google it. Well, she gets to interact with the main six as a friend, as an equal. And she doesn't care how epically she might fail or or the collateral damage, such as impacting herself upon the ceiling. She just likes the fact that she gets to hang with them and they're not all bowing. No one's saying, oh, Princess Celestia, we're not worthy or trying to be prim and proper. She just likes being with them. And it's, it is a grand gift. And the funny thing is that this is a more positive showing for Celestia than in the entire Accord arc. Mm -hmm. And, the thing is with this comic, and okay, in all honesty, I have to say that it's similar to a really popular fan fiction called uh, Sunny Skies All Day. The synopsis is Celestia here is, well, is tired and she needs a vacation. Um, she does a spell to turn herself into a Pegasus and travels to Ponyville. Um, this was done way back in season one, by the way, so... A lot of has developed over time, but still the idea is there. But still, I do like this story and anything that has to do with Celestia cutting loose and enjoying herself is fun. We get to see Celestia in this comic hang on and cut loose. We get to see Harry hug Celestia and giving her the Russian bear hug. Yeah. And of course, uh, probably the best line from Celestia, I wanted to try being rude. You know what? <laughs> it felt great. Being rude is fun. <laughs> yep, Remember, yep. kids. Uh, won't y- someone think of the children? Uh, true, uh, but still. And by the way, there's a TV trope on the little black dress thing. And yeah, 
it's been done in a lot of things and i think uh who's that actor i i i forgot the actors um maybe if i link you the links maybe you get an idea of who audrey what's her name audrey heppard something like that oh yeah audrey heppard yeah yeah I, uh, I think she was the one to start it out probably probably yeah but still um they uh you have it in batman the animated series with barbara gordon and uh fosters for imaginary friends and so on there, there, there's a lot even in um, comic books and anime and manga. That trope is there. For people who are interested, you should just check out TV tropes, little black dress thingy. It's there. Fun read, if you're interested. And as for this comic, getting to see Celestia cut loose is fun. Yeah, it's fun just to see her be, be someone other than the prim and proper. We got a little bit of that with, uh, you know, her, woohoo! <laughs> in, uh, and make new friends but keep discord and we got to see a little bit of it with uh, a royal problem but yeah. it's always welcome to see her cut loose just a little bit yeah yeah uh, I think that's what we really want more characterization out of a character and don't forget discord he played a huge part in this one too and I think uh, discord here is just being the support character for Celestia in this comic he's not really out there but he's looking out for her in a sense. So would we say this comic is more enjoyable than the actual mm -hmm. end of Chaos Theory? Yes, I, I would say that. Uh, there's something. I, I know people have problems with J. Ford Skid's art, but I've learned to accept it. And I say yes. this is cute. I, I say that his art here with the story here makes it really good. So I think we've said all we can say. True, true. And well... Uh, Silver, what are we going to do next week? Ah, next week we get to venture outside the realm of ponies for just a little bit. We're going to talk about Superman versus the Elite. Oh, and somehow that relates to what we're talking about today. Funny, eh? <laughs> ah, it's, it's how things work, but it it's carried off in a different way. Yes, yes. So, anywho, um, next week is going to be a Patreon-sponsored video by Master of Lag. He, uh, he wanted us to talk about Superman versus the Elite. And good timing, really, with what we've talked. So uh, we'll probably carry this um, mindset of conversation to that one, too. So, yeah, we'll talk about that next week. So, anywho, I'd like to thank the Patreon people. Um, I'd like to thank Lurker Cat, Twilight Genesis, Namdragatoria, Starstream, and also myself, Lag. And if you guys at home would like to join the thank you train, you can do that at patreon.com slash the MBS show. For a dollar, you get the thank yous and full access to everything we have on the Patreon. For five dollars, you get the same thing too, but we appreciate it a lot. <laughs> I don't know how to say thank yous. But anywho, I have been Norman Sanzo. And I am Cecil Vaquiel. We'll guys catch you next week with another amazing and fun review. See ya. Adios. So we are all in agreement that Fluttershy is best pony. I think so, though that was never truly in question. Yes, we are. We are in sync. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna say I'm a boy band. <laughs> uh, you just said Backstreet Boys or something. Uh, all right, be no boy band. <laughs>